This episode of The Clear Out was recorded on the 7th of November 2023 at home in Wicklow. And it is an episode about pyjamas. It's an episode about turning lights off and leaving some lights on. It is an episode about romance and maybe a form of idealism that I consider romantic and but I also look at romance in the more conventional sense connected to romantic love and I focus on two movies to uh, to discuss it one very recent one and one from quite a few years ago both of which I just watched and rate very highly um, I also share my thoughts on the Sylvester Stallone documentary that's just been put out on Netflix and I also have a little story to tell about a visitor to our house late late at night and how I dealt with it it wasn't it wasn't planned it wasn't booked in but it did have to be dealt with so i share that experience as well okay that's what's coming up i'll see you there cheers Ooh, not gonna change my mind leaving the dream behind keep my emojis. hi my name is dara clear and you're listening to the clear out you're very welcome thank you for joining me thank you for choosing this podcast and this episode of this podcast and pressing play when there's so much to choose from. So whatever brought you here, I'm very grateful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I am sitting in a shaft of light. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you, 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 I'm sure you're glad I added of light to that sentence. I am sitting in a shaft of light and it is gorgeous it's pretty cold uh, out there today but in the sun it's just lovely and here in the the home studio the green room as we refer to it in hashtag blessed um the sun is coming in through the window and i've just repositioned my setup so i can fully avail of that natural warmth that natural radiation and yeah as i said it's just it's just lovely <laughs> it's delicious and i'm very much enjoying enjoying what nature is giving me through the window as the wind blows and leaves fall and yes for the the third or fourth episode in a row i am going to say how lovely the leaves are they're really They've really come into their own in the last uh, the last week or two. Um, I had a beautiful walk last Tuesday morning. Did I did I did I did I talk about this last week? I may have um, a lovely walk in the woods. Um, we're very lucky. We have a, a lovely woods right beside us. Woods or wood? It's a lovely wood. Lovely woods. Anyway, trees. <laughs> trees and leaves and nature and paths and mushrooms it's pretty it's pretty raw and lovely though and even this morning i was out there earlier and coming back with pepper pepper the dog pepper the dog who's been with us for a year now um yeah she's uh she draws she draws focus pulls focus quite a bit um such is her inherent cuteness but I just took a moment at the end of our walk to stand underneath the predominantly yellow leaves of really it's the beech and birch trees that are have gone through the color shifts. Um, I was speaking to a guy this morning and he, he observed that the oak trees are a little bit slower to turn and slower to shed. But I was standing under this you know this this natural ceiling this 
this canopy to use probably an overused word in this context but this canopy of beautiful yellow leaves and it's an amazing thing just to be able to take a moment to enjoy that and go there it is there's that beauty there's that amazing aesthetic experience to be had and it'll be there whether I stand under it and appreciate it or not um yeah it was it was gorgeous though there's that word again gorgeous there's mrs h she's gorgeous that was uh stephanie powers in heart to heart i know i drop that in every now and again but always always a nice memory (laughs) and freeway the dog um in any case here we are another week another week moving closer to (laughs) mid-winter the year just seems to accelerate it accelerates at this time of year doesn't it do you do you do you experience that i feel like it does it just feels like you know you, you get through halloween and then suddenly you walk into shops and there's christmas music and it is it's all an accelerant just propelling us towards christmas propelling us towards the end of the year and i'm like hold on hold on there's still a there's still a couple of months left of 2023 let's um let's give them the value they deserve and not be coerced into a momentum that's not of our choosing i mean that's that's a good lesson in life in general i think um yeah so I have a few different things knocking around my head today. Um, turning lights on and off is one thing in my head. Pajamas is another thing in my head. Um, romance is another thing in my head. I'm just going to see if I can thread the needle um, with those ideas and draw draw the 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 connective tissue and see see what comes up um but i will start i will start today with uh just with uh, an announcement that i will be running a mindfulness um a mindfulness and breath work and sort of positivity class uh, starting next Wednesday, the 15th of October, I'm going to be running a class at Camerino Bakery at the Irish Museum of Modern Art in Kilmainham in Dublin. Um, 11 a.m., 11 in the morning on Wednesday, and I'll be running a class there every Wednesday until Christmas. So I think that'll be from next week. It'll be the, the six Wednesdays that take us up into kind of Christmas week. And it'll be fundamentally an hour or just under an hour of of breathing, of mindfulness, of focusing, of grounding, of centering and building sensitivity and awareness of of energy, of our own energy and how to how to engage one's energy and turn it on and let it flow and use it as a resource to be to be managed um to be observed to be witnessed and i spoke about this idea a few episodes ago um the the overarching concept that will inform the class is what i call the receptive mind and the idea of the receptive mind is that we allow ourselves to be in a place of internal stillness and observation and non-judgment and we receive information the information that is all around us the information that is environmental that is circumstantial that is incidental that is interpersonal that may be global we observe and acknowledge identify name whatever we do and just go okay that's what that's what it is um 
and we try to engage an idea of responsiveness rather than reactiveness and there's a lot of acknowledging of our internal state uh, that's where the mindfulness can come in and there's definitely there's definitely concepts connected to self-care and self-awareness and self-soothing um, but all of it is about equipping the the participant equipping ourselves with better resources better understanding of what we have and what we carry with us at all times and how we're even though we may feel it we're never truly disconnected um, if we can just bring our mind round to observing that state of connectedness rather than its opposite uh, and that's challenging that's challenging in the world we find ourselves living in at this moment in time with so many things to you know pull us this way and that and disperse our energy in ways that we feel we have no control over like a scattering of our energy and it can leave us feeling very dissolute and dislocated and so this class which is going to be a drop-in class there's no commitment to attend all classes um it's just a drop-in class come in spend 50 minutes to an hour doing the practice have a coffee or a tea or whatever at the the camarino bakery afterwards have a chat um so there'll be a social component to it as well and midweek is a good week to get that sort of recharge that sort of boost and hopefully you'll enjoy it so much that you'll come back for more so if that sounds like it might be your bag please do come along i'd love to see you there uh, you'll see the details on social media so just find the clear out on instagram or on facebook and you'll get the the details you need there so those links will be attached to wherever you're listening to this podcast as well so um yeah spread the word bring a friend um i'd love to i'd love to have you there um, it's something i really enjoy doing and i enjoy teaching facilitating guiding i get a lot out of it myself that's why um, i'm happy to step into a space and offer it to others um, i've been doing it for many years classes of this nature connected very much to qigong and tai chi practice elements of martial arts eastern thinking zen um, and just some of my own frames that i put on it my own ways of thinking about things that uh, i find are useful and other people seem to respond to so there you go that'll be next wednesday at camarino break bakery at imma the irish museum of modern art in kilmainham dublin love to see you there but um yeah see see if you can make it or spread the word to other people okay so that's that i might give that class a shout out again at the end of the ep don't be uh, don't be traumatized or triggered by that okay so where to begin let's begin in the darkness the literal darkness i am 99.9 percent .9 of the time the last person to go to bed in hashtag blessed at, in this in this lovely home that we have here in wicklow and the the procedure is make sure the pets are where i want them to be make sure there's no food left out for the pets to get the pets being the the two cats the elderly marlon the ever youthful and effervescent ruby the younger cat marlon's the older cat um and pepper the aforementioned pepper the dog who is really just uh she's only she turned one in september um so still a pup and full of mischief and destructive impulses um as most puppies are but she's absolutely lovely so making sure they're all in their respective spots marlon currently sleeps in a cardboard box <laughs> uh, face down in um 
in something cozy. Uh, there was a leopard print fleece or something in there that she was on. Uh, I noticed there are some woolens in the cardboard box and she really is an aged cat. So she's, she really does. She sleeps absolutely, you know, face down, nose to the floor. Um, and Pepper and Ruby sometimes share a couch, sometimes have a couch each. Sometimes there's another little spot that Ruby finds. Anyway, night, 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 kitty cats, night, night, puppy, the guinea pigs, they're in a cage. <laughs> they're in a cage in the utility room, just wondering where it all went wrong. <laughs> they don't get a good night. Um, and then I just move through the house and I turn all the lights off. And I go in, I go to bed, simple. And here's where the pyjamas comes in, come in. Or don't come in, as the case may be. I'm not a pyjama wearer. I haven't been. I'm a lifelong, um, I'm a lifelong in the nude sleeper. That's generally my mode. Unless I'm sick or, I don't know, particularly cold before I get into bed, I might get in with a pair of tracksuit bottoms on, a t-shirt. Um... But that would be it. I have no pajamas in the house. I have no. I have. Do you know what I have? I have. I have a pair of pajama shorts, like board short length, that were given to me as a joke by friends in Melbourne. Um, a, f- a few, a good few years ago, I feel. But they're incredible Hulk pajama bottoms, uh, without a matching top. S- and again, l- like Maeve, my daughter's always like, "Where, where are the Incredible Hulk pajamas?" And I generally just don't. I mean, again, it's just not my mode. And I heat up very quickly. So I can get into bed cold and be warm in, you know, in a minute. Um, So fine. This is not the point of this uh, discussion. So there I was. I went to bed Sunday night. Um... Not particularly late, uh, half ten maybe, just after half ten. What was I watching? I would watch. I watched the Sylvester Stallone documentary on Netflix, which was, um, yeah, quite entertaining. Um, again, it's funny. I mean, I spoke about the Arnold Schwarzenegger documentary series also on Netflix earlier this year, and how I came away from it just going, nah, I'm not really sure how honest Arnold is capable of being. And ultimately, I, even though I found, find his journey interesting and he is an interesting figure, I found his I found his inability to be really open, truly open and honest and transparent. I found that disappointing. Um, but similar to Stallone, um, he and Stallone, and it comes through in both documentaries, are very, um, you know, very attached to to their to their legacy. And the legacy of these iconic figures that they've played in movies. Um, Schwarzenegger, of course, has the whole bodybuilding, um, you know, his, his his total domination of bodybuilding for a period of time prior to his acting career. But both very sort of, you know, alpha driven, uh, alpha male driven guys, very ambitious. And, you know, that attachment to legacy is... You know, I, I don't think that's an unusual thing. I personally don't find it that interesting. Um, I think, you know, what's what's done is done. And the past is the past. And, you know, what's going on now? Like, where are you now is more interesting to me than, you know, where you were in the past. Um, and it's not to dismiss the past. But if it's, you know, if where you are now is in a constant regurgitation of the past or a reliving of the past or in some way an attempt to reanimate or revivify the past i don't find that that interesting um and both stallone and schwarzenegger definitely had that going on um but stallone i didn't know much about his backstory so that was interesting he had a um pretty troubled um family life um with uh, a violent father and parents who broke up and like that was really interesting and that legacy 
that legacy was very interesting to me and his his sort of abandoned son complex um or like how, you know how that trauma was still very palpably etched inside him uh, i found very interesting and um what was also interesting was that he was you know clearly a a student of of theater back in the day and referring to arthur miller's a view from the bridge a play i'm very fond of um and i, I had no idea he I, I had no idea stallone was sort of theater literate um i didn't think less of him for it but it was just a nice revelation and then late in the documentary he's showing on his home uh his home theater one of his favorite movies which is the lion in winter um which i'm not sure if you're familiar with that film it's um this sort of uh period drama um featuring i can't remember which english king it's meant to be is it richard is it played by peter o'toole Catherine Hepburn's there as his wife and they're both coming to the end of their time and it's it, it's got kind of King Learish episode uh, you know a, a King Learish flavour to it because it features um, feuding children um, I, and if I recall correctly Anthony Hopkins was one of the sons so sons instead of daughters that's where it departs from the King Lear structure and uh, a young Timothy Dalton later to be James Bond for a couple of movies um but yeah like it's it's it's, it's all about this you know f- fiery ferocious uh stubborn father who's basically going you know I reject all of you I reject you my sons and uh, it was just fascinating to see yes yeah, Stallone going yeah this is yeah one of my all-time favorites um it was, so it was all there for us to see so that was interesting anyway Stallone <laughs> sorry that was a digression um a line in winter I, I don't know what year that was was it late 60s early early 70s Anthony Hopkins I think you know very young Anthony Hopkins early 70s I'd say um so in any case I was yeah heading to bed and I had to be up early as I'm doing a bit of work uh, for one of my aunts at the moment and she's in Dublin and I'm down in Wicklow and so to beat the traffic I get up very early to uh, still do my morning routine take Pepper out into the back field and do some qigong breathing stuff and kick a ball for her um, and then have time for breakfast make a lunch and then try and get on the road around six and get into Dublin for seven so that's that's been the routine a few days a week for the last few weeks as I've been doing a bit of work in, in my aunt's house so my alarm was set for I don't know 20 to 5 and I was in a deep sleep but I was woken in the pitch dark by the sound of Pepper barking and that is unusual and it's a disturbing sound in the middle of the night to have your dog bark in the house and we're in the middle of the countryside and it's darkness all around um, and I went down to tell Pepper to be quiet and I didn't know I, I suspected it might have had something to do with one of the cats sometimes they have these battles in the night and to bring this back to pyjamas I'd broken my pyjama rule I'd put on a t-shirt but that's it nothing else so just a t-shirt to uh, <laughs> to protect me from the gaze of the universe and um i went down i told pepper to be quiet and she was just like staring at the back door and in that room it's it's it, it's it's we have like i think 20 windows in that room a few skylights um panes of glass on two walls and glass doors and Pepper staring and barking and I flick on the light and there's a bearded man standing right at the door and so I just took a I took a beat and I was like oh it just took me a second and I realized it was my youngest brother and it was a quarter past three in the morning 
and my youngest brother who unfortunately has um a long history of pretty profound mental health problems and um and is an and is a drug addict um was there and so i opened the door and just tried to assess very quickly what his state was and i realized that he well i don't know if i realized what my my sense was how i perceived it i i reckoned that he wasn't directly under the influence of any substances at that moment even though he wasn't making a lot of sense and um his brain was clearly addled is the word i would use um and i was just like yeah i brought him in and um you know just was trying to decide what to do you know my 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 daughter just had a week off school it was her going to be her first morning back at school and yeah i i could see he really wasn't in good shape uh, my brother and i was like no i don't want him to be here i don't want him to be here in the morning when you know my wife and daughter wake up because he just wasn't in the right uh, frame of mind the energy wasn't right and um i was just like okay look just sleep on the couch for a little while i'll be up in another hour or so and i'll make some decisions then but he wasn't really receiving what i was saying so i grabbed him a sleeping bag and left him there and i went back to bed and i just got i i, I sort of had such a, a shot of adrenaline just from the the drama of the situation that i went back to bed and i didn't really settle i, I, I kind of just i wasn't like stressed or anxious but i just wasn't really able to go back to sleep so i just lay there and kind of you know reflected on my thoughts thought about stallone <laughs> Thought about Stallone, thought about my brother, thought about Pepper the dog. And um, yeah. And then Pepper's barking again. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm getting up now. And actually an hour had passed. So now it was about half four. So I go down and Pepper, is, yeah, barking again. Stops when I walk in. My brother's just sitting on the couch and clearly hasn't slept. And so um, I make him a cup of tea and I told him I'm just going to go out with the dog as I do and take, you know, pepper out and do my normal thing. And so I put on like a jacket and a hat and a head torch and I walked up into the back field. Now from the back field, I can still see into that room where my brother was. I can still see the house and I was only up in the field a minute and I could see him moving very erratically around the room. And I just thought, no, I've got to go back in. Because I don't know what this, you know, it's probably not helping his head, wherever it's at, to see me disappear into the darkness with the dog. So I came back and, you know, I just told him to sit down and try to kind of chill out. Um, but again, not receiving my frequency at all and just not being particularly, not communicating very clearly, which is a feature of his behavior when he's, in this kind of altered state, very disconnected, dislocated language, fragments uh, of ideas, often with themes of, um, well, not themes of paranoia, but you know, themes that indicate paranoia being, you know, attacked or um, referring to, you know, pains in his head or, you know, different people or different places. And that was one thing I wasn't, still wasn't able to get out of him was where he was based at the moment. Because I was already trying to think of you know, where I'd like to bring him. But in any case, I decided, no, I'm just going to stay here in the room and I'll just continue with my morning routine. So I just did my breathing exercises, you know, qi gong, basically. And I wasn't being hostile to him. I wasn't shutting him out. Uh, I was very present. I was very, you know, he was in front of me sitting as I just did these stretches. And... It was fascinating because, you know, two things happened. Like one, as soon as I just kind of got into my flow of really just focusing on my breath and doing the, you know, the, the moves, the sequences that, you know, go with the breath. 
I I got kind of clarity. I got kind of instant clarity on my plan of action, um, which I you know which had been still been pretty vague, probably because I was a bit rattled by having them there in that state at that time. Um, and obviously there's a there's a protective instinct as well. Like I, I don't want to I don't want my wife and daughter to be exposed to him when he's like that. But I just got total clarity in terms of right. I'm going to finish up. The, you know what I have to do, and when I'm leaving, he's leaving with me, and you know I'm going, to, I'm going to drop him somewhere between Wicklow and Dublin. That was the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened was he also seemed to de-escalate. The longer I went with my breathing, and I could just I could feel his energy just dropping. I could feel his energy coming back to his own sort of center. And he just came right down and I finished and he was just kind of sitting, I mean, quiet. And then I just got myself organized, put on my clothes, um, my other clothes, clothes for work. And I made, uh, you know, breakfast. I made myself a lunch. I made him a, a packed lunch as well. And then he's like, and then he seemed to just kind of reach that stage where he was able to sleep. <laughs> so suddenly his shoes are off and he's putting a jacket over his head and he just crashed out and I'm like don't get too comfortable we're leaving in half an hour um, and then trying to wake him was a challenge but I um, I managed to get him out the door um, and he was already eating the food I'd prepared for him and he was able to tell me where he'd like me to drop him, which is kind of yeah, halfway between our place in Dublin. And he, he just fell back asleep in the car and I dropped him off and I I wished him well. And I told him I loved him and on I went. And yeah, it was full on. And look, I'm not, <laughs> I'm far, far from the first person in the family to have this kind of experience with him and you know he's had a very rocky road and had some pretty serious situations in his life including prison time um overseas and in ireland um but i rarely if ever um hit him with you know with judgment because i don't see the point i just try to offer him a safe moment um, and then I just felt it was important to yeah I felt it was important even though I'm not I don't feel that much love because of a lot of his behavior gets in the way of the easy um, the easy flow of love but he and I I, I was going to say he and I were close it, it wasn't that it was that I was 12 when he was born and I used to take care of him quite a bit when he was a baby and, you know, change his nappy and do all that sort of stuff. And so I, I always felt a very strong bond to him and protective impulse around him. You know, he, you know, as a kid, he'd come into my bed at night and just kind of snuggle up as a little fella. Um, and he was a very, very cute little guy. <laughs> and... It's hard. It's hard to see that person inside him now, um, because his his brain is often, and you know this may be an inappropriate way to put it, but like his brain is somewhere else. How you know his his reality is somewhere else, and how he sees things and perceives things is somewhere else. So it's very hard to connect in those circumstances. Um. But, and this is where I, I'm going to draw the connection back to, to romance, because I know romance is typically, you, you know, we're, we're talking about eros or, you know, that kind of love that's about romantic attachment, uh, romantic relationships. But I, there's a romance, I think, that can attach to other relationships as well. Um, and maybe that's adjacent to maybe it's a little bit adjacent to sentimentality I don't know um, but there's a romance in in embracing brotherhood or, or sisterhood um, 
that connection you know that, that like a fraternal connection a sibling connection you know family friendship there can be a romance when you step out of the the actual connection and and name it and place a value on it and identify it and that can be useful sometimes um and i just you know my, my, my thinking was yeah of course deep down i love this guy um even though I don't feel very connected to him at all and haven't for a very long time. But my thinking was it's, it may, it may be a comfort to him, you know, where I'm basically, you know, the whole, you know, you know, the, the, the arc of the experience, which was basically a, you know, a, a three and a half hour arc, the arc of that moment last Sunday into Monday morning. Well, it was all early Monday morning. The the arc ultimately was one of rejection. Because I'm basically saying, no, you can't be here in this house and I'm taking you somewhere else and I've no idea where you're going, but I'm dropping you at that next point of departure. And this is rejection, even though I tried to either assuage my own guilt um by making those offerings of some food and i gave him a jacket and a pair of gloves um but those gestures were meant to be an indication of care as well and maybe for him to walk away going yeah i've been rejected i've been kicked out i've been dropped off out of the car in on a dark november morning but the last thing he'll hear is i love you um and maybe that has no meaning <laughs> maybe it doesn't now he told me he loved me too that's fine um but i just thought maybe that is of some use and i think there is i think there is a romance in that um a romance in the idea that love very literally expressed and demonstrated can have true positive impact and maybe that's just a tiny 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 light that he can keep lit in an ongoing very cold very harsh very dangerous battle that he he lives on a daily basis um yeah so that was that was how my week started um that's pretty full on and um yeah, I mean, I always wish him well, but I'm very clear about what I'm willing to do and not willing to do. And anyone who has been touched by addiction or alcoholism, uh, which of course is, is its own, yeah, which is its own form of addiction. Uh, anyone who's been touched by it knows, knows this story. Um, they know, they know these dynamics they know these patterns of behavior and they know the idea of boundaries they know the idea of of tough love um and it is tough and these things come at a price and where i come back to the idea of romance is the idea of romance and the idea of keeping lights on in the darkness um I value that idea really highly. It's where a lot of my, my hope lives. It's where a lot of my compassion lives. And it's where a lot of my sense of self lives. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in actively, actively, conscientiously fighting against cynicism fighting against pessimism fighting against spiritual defeat fighting against the the kind of the erosion of of openness the erosion of faith that we can have better experiences and better moments life crashes in constantly and the longer we live, <laughs> the more it seems to do it. And I don't know if that's a relationship to our, 
you know, I th- well, I, I do. I think it's a relationship to our experience. It's a relationship to age. Um, it's 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 a relationship to sort of a sense of dwindling time and dwindling resources. Um, and I think, you know, cynicism and jadedness and a hardening of our metaphorical hearts um, are the consequences of of living longer <laughs> and you know living in in a world that seems to move further and further away from these very ide- idealistic ideas of of love connection hope um togetherness thoughtfulness um the the, 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 the very idea of of fellowship of being a fellow traveller and I won't go on a political rant because I think you know there are components of of sort of consumerism consumerism and capitalism that are in this mix that have encouraged sort of deep pathological like pathologically cultural selfishness and self-centeredness in so many of us it's the consumer kind of dream you know that you just all all your sense of value and self-worth is caught up in consumption and products and accumulation and property and the material world and so many of us get sucked into um the, the 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 scramble and the dance um and you know i'm not immune to it at all in spite of choices i've made in my life yeah sure <laughs> i'd i'd like to be in a in a better position in in many ways um materially but i try to walk this line where i don't lose sight of what i feel is more important to me and it it rarely has anything to do with the material material possessions or material wealth um or you know other things connected to that um and so to move accelerate a bit further on this track i'm going to to end you know to, to, i'm going to, have to spend the rest of the podcast just talking about a couple of movies which are deeply deeply romantic and idealistic and i watched them both recently um and they probably couldn't be further away from each other tonally um maybe even thematically but i found myself thinking about them and reflecting on the idea of of the of the more conventional idea or the more conventional understanding of romance and its place and where uh where that might be in, in you know in your life and how uh, you know, and, and i asked the question you know have you left have you left that light on have you left that door open or are you you know are you in a place in your life where that doesn't mean anything to you where it feels frivolous or or childish immature um irrelevant um is it just not part of what you're concerned with concerned about um because that's again i go back to the idea of you know leaving a light on you know leaving a light on inside like don't don't extinguish all the candles um i I bumped into a friend in dublin yesterday uh an actor friend of mine lovely guy david how are you if you're listening i know i feel like i know about 50 million (laughs) dublin based actors called dave or david (laughs) and a few of them are my friends um this is this is dave h if you're listening dave uh and anyway dave was telling me that um he he'd started playing a bit of music again and I, I, I don't know if i knew this but he'd been a he'd been a musician as a, as a younger guy 
had a quite a nice acting career from my perspective. I, I, I saw him in a few different things. I think he's a very good actor as well. As well as a great bloke. But um, he was talking about how he's back playing a bit of music, playing drums with some other musicians and they rehearse and I could see his eyes lighting up and he's just going, oh, I'm just enjoying it so much. It's so good for me to be doing it. And, you know, he'd had a long time away from music and I just thought, yeah, brilliant. You know, that light was never put out and he was able to return to it. And I think, you know, that's the thing. It's, if you let the light go out, it can be, it can, it can, the longer it's out, the harder it can be to turn it on again. You know, and whatever your, you know, whatever image works for you, whether it's a candle, whether it's a little fire, whether it's a light bulb, um, it can be hard. It can be hard to get that light back on and draw on the light and the heat and the illumination if, if you've let it go if you let light dormant. So I'm a huge believer in keeping the lights on, even if they become very dim. I just let the, I let my mind or my consciousness just pass by every now and again and just check in and go, oh yeah, there you are, you're still there. <laughs> the little candle flickering in the wind. <laughs> Um, you know, that dim, dim light that's still somehow glowing. You know, when a, a bulb can have an an audible glow, an audible buzz. And it's like, okay, there's still life there in that area. Where, where, and whatever it is, it, you know, it's not for me to say what that is. But, because um, it could be, it could be many different things. It could be many different things. Um, it could be, it could be a place you like to go to. It could be, a particular you know genre of books you like reading it could be anything at all it could be a particular type of food it, you know often i think yeah aesthetic but it might ju- it might be a very personal private practice or ritual um and i think it's i just think it's of such such enormous value to to let yourself go to those places to go actually i'm going to do that again or i'm going to check in with that or i'm going to i'm just going to add a bit more fuel to that because i feel like i need that to burn a bit brighter at the moment and so i come back to romance and <laughs> i found myself watching jerry Maguire the other night the tom cruise the 1996 tom cruise yes vehicle as almost every Tom Cruise movie is. It's a Tom Cruise vehicle. He doesn't really do the kind of co-starring thing, you know, where he's of equal weight with somebody else in the cast. It's always a Tom, it's always the Tom Cruise show. And whether or not I've commented on this before, um, you may or may not agree, like Tom Cruise, he's not a natural lover. Um, He is somewhat asexual he is a blisteringly bright performer he has got energy that can take over the screen the room Uh, he has a nice comic side to his acting when he wants to use it but what he inevitably and invariably brings to everything that he does and has done is intensity and he can channel that intensity into an appearance of romance a a facsimile of romance an imitation of romance love desire but he's never really fully convincing even if um not so relevant for me but if you're you know if you're a straight woman uh you might have you know tom cruise may have been a very sexy guy to you at some point i certainly remember when i was in school in the 80s the girls tom cruise was way up there way up there very high on that list tom cruise michael j fox (laughs) this is the generation we're talking about um but jerry Maguire is such a successful film like it works on so many levels it's a great satire of um of the world of sport and sports representation sports agents um really cleverly written by Cameron Crowe 
um, was it his second or third film? He doesn't say anything with John Cusack. Um, and then afterwards he did Almost Famous, which I think is beloved of maybe maybe of music journalists and um, guitarists the world over and rock fans. I actually don't love Almost Famous, even though I absolutely cherish Frances McDormand's performance in it. I think she's brilliant. Um, but yeah otherwise yeah i'm not i've never been that impressed by it i watched it a couple of times but jerry Maguire, i love i love and i love it for a couple of reasons um i love it for the idealism of tom cruise's character and there's romance in that idealism he's the sports agent who just has this burnout epiphany of oh this industry is so horrible it's so cynical it's so soulless and it's just so like greedy and venal and vile and in this kind of fit of you know yeah epiphany informed idealism he writes this manifesto of we've got to do better and we've got to you know reduce the number of clients um reduce the money um and you know increase the love uh and he you know he, he prints it off <laughs> and there's a great moment where he goes to the printer shop and there's a kind of a hippie-ish kind of guy going yeah man you know right on you know fight your fight you know f- you know fly your freak flag kind of thing and it's just you know you just that scene that scene alone you're going it's doomed <laughs> it's doomed it's just very it's great comic writing and you know sure enough he goes into his, you know, massive sports agency where he's been this kind of top performer for years and everyone's kind of clapping him and cheering him. But they're also kind of going, this guy is dust. He is dead. He's dog food. He's gone. Um, and sure enough, he gets the sack. And the only person who will walk out with him is uh, an accountant, a young female accountant played by the young Renee Zellweger and she is so inspired by what he's written that she's like i am fully on board with this and ultimately the story is one of his sort of idealistic triumph um and their very sort of tricky flawed strangely motivated romance that ultimately comes comes through and becomes true and arrives at a you know the the sort of cathartic climactic moment of the movie with the well I'll, I'll give you the famous lines in due course um but a very important part of the success of the movie is the relationship between cuba gooding jr uh between cuba gooding jr as this sort of underperforming play it safe um, I think he's a wide receiver in the world of American football. I don't know much about American football. I know they wear pads and helmets and batter each other. But Cuba Gooding Jr. is a sort of an underperforming um, and very um, uh, resentful player coming to the final years of his career. And he wants he wants to score big. He wants the big money. But he's not putting himself on the line Um but he's, he's a great, great character, Rod Tidwell. Great, great character. And he's this kind of, he's this challenge. He's this, you know, he's been sent to kind of torment Tom Cruise. And he's the only client that Tom Cruise ends up hanging on to. Um, and Cuba Gooding Jr. is married to uh, Regina Wright. Regina King, sorry. Regina King in one of her earlier roles. And she's absolutely brilliant. And their chemistry is just fantastic just these two ah oh, it's just they're, they're just such a, a rich vein of vitality in the movie um and they're intensely it's an intensely romantic couple but it's so full of humor it's but it's they're played so well the actors do so well to convey the the, the truth and the history underneath the love that they're demonstrating throughout and of course it it's this great comparison point because tom cruise <laughs> tom cruise 
Tom Cruise maybe the person as well as Jerry Maguire the character just don't know how to love and then Renee Zellweger is like she's a single mother and maybe one of my maybe my favourite relationship in, in, in the movie is actually her relationship with her sister played by Bonnie Hunt who's like the more experienced uh, you know single woman been through it and she's kind of you know world weary and she has her women's group the you know the divorced wives group but she's very mindful of her sister and her sister's uh, <laughs> little son played by the ridiculously cute and charming Jonathan Lipnicki. Um, Ray is the character's name. And again, Tom Cruise finds it easy to like Ray. Um, but, you know, they, they go on the journey. The story plays out and there's triumph for for Rod Tidwell, Cuba Gooding Jr. And there's triumph for Tom Cruise in his role as his agent. The love is there, the success is there. And ultimately, in that moment of triumph, in that, you know, that this high point of, you know, of Jerry Maguire's rebirth, he realizes this doesn't mean anything if I'm not sharing it with somebody. And he, he goes back to Renee Zellweger um and walks into the house and the sisters there and all the divorced women and now renee zellweger who in this kind of impulsive moment in the story you know she and tom cruise got married and then they're like no this is ridiculous it's not working so she's one of the, the you know the jilted wives and he walks in the door and he makes his speech um and he utters those famous lines which were foreshadowed early in the story you complete me and then <laughs> he tries to keep going. He's on his he's on his intense crying but not crying Tom Cruise journey, and you know it's just so t- it's such a Tom Cruise performance. All his things that he does, you know, kind of the, the clenched mouth, the teared up eyes, the lowered voice, um, the, the you know the laser focus on Zellweger, and then Zellweger just shuts him up and says, "You had me at hello." And she does that kind of weepy, kind of squinty, voicey face, facey voice. Goes, you had me at hello. And, you know, they have their big kiss. And it's, you know, it's fantastic. <laughs> and I cried. <laughs> I cried. I was moved. I was very moved. And I was on the journey. I was on the romance journey. And, you know, there's another, you know, there's another sequence in the movie where Bruce Springsteen's, um, is it? Is it what's it called? Secret Garden? Is that, that's the song, isn't it? That's playing, and Zellweger's moving barefoot through the garden at night, about to go on a date with Tom Cruise. Also brilliant. So many, so many good elements in this movie. That's what elevates it, and it elevates it around the ever unchanging Tom Cruise persona. And it's such a perfect vehicle for what Tom Cruise was able to do. It makes it one of his all-time best films. Um, and I'm not sure what films you'd take. If you had to take three films from the Tom Cruise filmography, I'd take Jerry Maguire. I'd probably take Rain Man and Magnolia. And you've got it there. I mean, maybe Top Gun. But Top Gun actually isn't a great movie. Like Rain Man, the Tom Cruise performance, is is the one to take from Rain Man. Um, yeah, anyway but the romance is there and uh, you know if you haven't seen Jerry Maguire what the hell go and enjoy it and you can enjoy it as a sports movie you can enjoy enjoy it as a romantic comedy um, a romantic drama even the stakes are high and again if you're open to the transformative power of love of the romantic gesture you'll be moved I defy you not to be moved great soundtrack Great script, great acting, lots of fun, lots of funny stuff. So, the second romantic movie that I checked out this weekend was the absolutely, what? Absolutely brilliant, absolutely stirring, um, moving, um, thought-provoking, and really 
distinct and original past lives the directorial debut and also written by Celine Song um, who's I guess Korean American American Korean or American Canadian Korean um, brilliant just brilliant and a really interesting intriguing um, seductive movie that is absolutely about love and romance and and friendship and and destiny and roads not taken and in the very specific case of the story in past lives there's a deep engagement with the idea of i suppose i mean you know you know reincarnation of living through centuries of experience of going again and again and again and being drawn to or connected to or placed beside by the universe another person to whom you are fatally linked connected and it's um it's really brilliant it's really really brilliant um and i know i is it a i'm not even sure if it's a movie you can spoil but uh, yeah i'll try and be careful because like i mean i i think it, it it's worth going on the journey without knowing too much about it. Um, I knew a bit about it. I'd heard a couple of, um, you know, film podcasts, uh, you know, treat it earlier this year. And I was keen to watch it. And, um, yeah. But basically, it's the story of two people who are childhood friends. Um, and childhood friends on the verge of being childhood sweethearts in seoul in korea um and the the girl of of the couple of, of these friends her family migrate they migrate to to canada and we get a sense of these two people in the you know these early scenes when they're like 12 years old that she has a very blithe nature um that she's taking it all in her stride and there's a lightness and a breeziness and a loveliness to her um whereas he's a bit more internal and a bit more sullen i suppose and he's, you can see how he's taking things deep but they have this natural bond this natural chemistry there's a fun you know there's an element of fun to their relationship and their exchanges um and very you know just for, again if, you know i spoke about scorsese last week in killers of the flower moon just a really nice touch from the director in her choices and in her storytelling choices and um she's a she's a playwright as well celine song um so you know this wasn't her first her first rodeo so to speak but you're left in no doubt when the two kids have to part you're left in no doubt that this is this is resonating in different ways for each of them and for him this is this is a pain that he's not going to let go of too quickly and we we go on the journey then with the the characters but the journey is divided into 12 year periods so we, we meet them again 12 years later and celine is now uh has moved from canada to new york she's you know young professional playwright and you know living you know living her life you know in that you know very international city and they reconnect 
they reconnect online and you think well that's not going to be that interesting but the way they play it out the way Celine's song directs it um, the stakes feel really high and it's the strength of the two actors that are giving us this feeling uh, Greta Lee plays Nora and Teo what is it is it Teo Yu Teo Lu I just want to check his name I don't want to I don't want to get that wrong. Um, Teo Yu. That's T-E-O. Teo Yu. Y-O-O. He plays Hai Sung. And yeah, the stakes feel really high. And it's just kind of gripping. You're just kind of watching going, where's this? Where's this going? Um, and there is, there's, there's a framing device in the film. There's a framing device in the film. So we, when the film opens, we're seeing these guys later again in life. And there's a third member of the group um, who is not Korean, who is American. And somebody is observing them and speculating on who they might be. And we spend very little time with them before we're brought back to childhood. And then we meet them in their 20s. And then the story shifts again. And it's 12 years later. And Hai Sung has finally found his way to, to New York and yeah this is you know this is the final act of the movie and you know Nora is now with with someone else and they are still they are still negotiating this relationship they're still trying to work out what what is this thing between us what is this bond and this attraction that we feel um even though we are clearly living very separate lives um and when they were in their their 20s nora makes a very clear decision to go you know what let's not be in touch for a while let's break contact because i need to be focusing on other things in my life and that break in contact which was ostensibly going to be for you know a medium term uh, period becomes the, the 12 years another 12 years and so again for that final act we're going what's what's the baggage what's coming here but it's so well written and so beautifully performed um that yeah you, you uh, like i found myself watching I'm like where is this going like where is it going to end and it's just Again, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but you know the, the, the stakes are high. The you know, uh, you know, Nora has her American husband played by John. Um, is it John Nagaro? Golly gosh, I'm sorry. I need to go and check his name as well. John Magaro, who I recognised immediately. He was one of the young kind of finance heads in uh, The Big Short a few years ago, but I, I hadn't really seen him in anything else. But he's great as well. He and you know he has a, a great sort of um examination of this threat to his his marriage this you know this 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 threat to um his his happiness and his love and again greta lee's character nora she's just kind of she just always seems sort of somewhat untroubled by everything but you know you know things are happening underneath the surface you know there's some sort of churn the cogs are turning deep down inside emotionally and her her chemistry with Hai Sung is is really lovely and her performance for me is the one that uh, kind of kind of lights up the movie but a really really special film formally structurally really interesting Again, a deft hand. I used that phrase last week for Scorsese as well, for Killers of the Flower Moon. But this was just like such assured filmmaking, uh, such great confidence in going, I don't need to tell you everything. It's a real kind of show, don't tell movie. Um, and the actors just encapsulate something that was so believable, so palpable, so um so likable as well like i really cared i cared for you know for each of the three main characters um and 
yeah just a really well written script like really well written script lovely just lovely lovely words <laughs> lovely ideas and just these lovely notes these really choice notes at different times in the in the symphony of the story um so i i really couldn't recommend it highly enough um you know take yourself to a cinema to see it um or or or, or, or watch it online streaming you know it's there but you know it's it, it's a movie that will get you thinking about you know relationships it'll get you thinking about love it'll get you thinking about romance um it's not jerry Maguire. <laughs> it's tonally a million miles from jerry Maguire. um it's a lot more muted and contemplative it's not a comedy um but it's really lovely it's lovely to look at it's lovely to listen to and um yeah they're they're great characters to go on the journey with and you know the 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 final the final moments are they're sort of as romantic as you'll ever see in a movie i feel but very in not in a conventional way at all like there's a great thoughtfulness and sophistication to the final kind of beats of the story that will just send you away you know thinking about the implications um so yeah do yourself a favor check it out make it a double bill jerry Maguire and past lives um yeah great 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 stuff keep 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 that light on keep the romance light on you know you you, you need you, you, why would you choose to turn those lights off these are the things that'll you know keep us warm at night you know <laughs> when we have no pajamas <laughs> okay that's it um i'm done i'm done for another week um do please 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 do come and check out the the class i'm going to be running at camerino bakery at imma the irish museum of modern art starting wednesday the 15th of november i'm calling that class the receptive mind but that is a class for breath work for energy flow for mindfulness for positivity and i think you'll get a lot out of it if you can make the time 11 a.m uh, next wednesday and every wednesday until christmas you'll find the details online um you can check out my instagram account facebook um the clear out is in all those lovely places we're on it's on youtube as well you might even find me on twitter occasionally i don't really go on twitter I, 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 yeah don't have a lot of time for what that is and elon musk give me a break okay if you like what you hear please spread the word share recommend review rate all that stuff helps it helps build this thing that i do and i'd be very grateful and if you're really into it you can support me on patreon that's patreon.com forward slash the clear out and i'd welcome whatever you could contribute to this independent creative and very much loved process loved by me <laughs> it's up to you I, I don't know i don't know where or what your love level is like for this thing okay stay safe stay well stay romantic i'll talk to you soon mind yourselves all the best bye Keep